Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> yeah. So that's a pretty wonderful, thorough um, prelude. And I uh, imagine there will be some changes throughout. Uh, subtle changes may occur depending on how we can continue to use this medium. Mm, I'm looking at how I can possibly add a little bit more to fill in some of the blank spaces in, in the days. Uh, uh, and also to remind you that the, the retreat says it, it says it continues until June 4th, actually continues through June 4th. So we won't finish until the end of June 4th in, uh, in Britain. Uh, so, and the idea is that we can all get together, everybody in the world, probably with a little bit of, you know, manipulation, we can all gather together right at the end to be together in the same place uh, as per the final um, session of, of the retreat. That would be the end of, uh, that would be on June 4th. Uh, so um, this morning or earlier, I started with the salutation, which is the uh, it's sort of setting an atmosphere for how you enter a holy place, how you enter a sacred place, how you make a sacred place, how you begin to internalize it. Yeah. And so this is not a matter of focusing on sensations because sensations are not holy places. Holy places are about aspirations, energies, uh, openness of heart, groundedness, feeling safe, feeling welcome. That's what they're about. Um, <laughs> you know, so, and this is very important because this is a more fundamental reality than, than sensations, which are, you know, <laughs> not really too much of a, most of the time, not much of a big deal. Um, and so I think one of the beauties of, well, being at home is you can feel, you know, you're in your own comfort, comfortable known place. Um, but then also to be aware that you don't want to just go into a mundane, um, you know, casual mode. So it's a certain brightening up, rising up within that and using this very, Puja form, chanting, um, bringing the voice forth, uh, saying salutations. These are not casual, casual experiences. Um, they're, they're, they're resonant and uh, universal experiences. They're not related to anybody's home or circumstance. They're, they're transcendent. Um, and this is the, uh, the foundation, really, that we that we stand upon in practice, the entering the transcendent, entering the sacred. And then you, you, know, so you contemplate or you work with your daily circumstances from that particular perspective. You know, the Buddha's perspective was, if you like, the four devadutas, which means the four heavenly messages, which means old age, sickness, death, and the holy one. Remember the last one. So these are not about anybody's specific circumstances. You know, they're about everybody's uh, potential. Uh, some of them are potential of the mortal form. The others, the last one is the potential of the heart for awakening, for purity, for clarity. Um, however, that frames up for you, however you feel for that. Um, yeah. Uh, um, and just to realize this is very fundamental you know, that we all have in common, somewhere beneath all our concerns, they all come down to, you know, baseline, how do I bring forth what's most beautiful uh, in myself? You know, we've been gifted a life, how do you bring forth what's truly wonderful and, uh, and bright? And there is something. Um, how do you get free from, you know, things you regret and, and feel sad about? How do you get free from regret and, and guilt? How do you get free from obsession? How do you get free from, you know, addictive habits and, you know, bad mind states, uh, mess things up? Mm -hmm. And so there's this cry of the heart to find, get, get me clear, clear, get me free. You know? <laughs> and how does this all get in here? <laughs> you know? And so the theme of clearing the floods is we get saturated. <laughs> Yeah. we're very um, permeable we look like we're kind of separate entities with nice 
clear boundaries, but actually in terms of the heart, we're not. We're, we're totally permeable. You know? uh, and the un <laughs> unaware person acts as if they're impermeable and they can just go crashing around. Uh, and what they say doesn't count and what it doesn't, you know, because they're, they're impermeable. The wise one recognizes they are permeable, therefore they're, they're selective about what they open up to. Um, and they also recognize as things that have been, they've been saturated and they need to discard or clear out that are no longer necessary or helpful or in fact are degrading. Mm -hmm. And so this is the bhavana, the cultivation to both protect oneself from the unnecessary, unskillful, uh, ignoble, degrading, and to maintain, um, you know, distinct separation from that, and then to bond to what's truly bright and to stay with it. These are the four right efforts. Mm. Mm. Clearing. But we have been flooded. Mm. And the floods are, come to three levels. Most superficial is just flooded by sense data, yeah, uh, which seems to be the main thing, you know, and in particular in our uh, current age where you can be deluged by media information, you know, uh, which uh, from all, all channels, well, 24 hours a day. Um, and the intensity of that increases, uh, um, you know, particularly through the public media. Yeah, so the, 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 the intensity of it. Uh, so, I mean, when I was young, we didn't have a television set. The first television we set, set we had was nine inches, nine inch square <laughs> thing with occasional black and white image on it. <laughs> One channel, occasionally. <laughs> this sober voice, something with a suit and tie reading the news <laughs> and now you've got I don't know how many television channels and internet stuff just banging away and music crashing in and you, even the weather report is stimulating you know with noise and music and magical things happening uh, so it is in intensely stimulated saturation uh, and of course as people get numbed out by that they just increase the stimulation increase the volume to make it come get in so certainly this is a big effect and <clears throat> you know, in a retreat situation one of the blessings is just be able to switch it off, you know, uh, and to switch it off or to turn it down, which, and for some people that, that, that sometimes that is difficult because you begin to realize there's a certain addictive effect All that stimulation ramps up your nervous system and it, it starts to, only operate, you know, feel funny if you're not getting stimulated. It sags, it goes dysfunctional. Uh, I remember reading an article of a woman who was, you know, looking at meditation or thinking about meditation. And she said the idea of not having her phone on for 10 minutes was like, you know, 600 seconds. That's a bit serious, isn't it? I mean, maybe three seconds, but not 600 of no stimulation, I, you know, she hadn't had that amount of unstimulated time. So her, her mind was bonded to that, that level of input, you know, to keep going. Uh, and on a, on a, which is to my mind, just astonishing. I don't think I could, I couldn't manage having that amount of stimulation. Well, you can, but and clearly sometimes people when they come to monasteries it's, it's too quiet you know they can't sleep because it's too quiet you know because the system you begin to recognize it's even the sensory level isn't just it washes over and passes no it doesn't wash over and passes it washes over and it sets resets your nervous system resets what your mind is geared to and if you don't get that you start to feel you know un disoriented so these floods, are, this is a powerful experience being flooded and a wise person realizes, you know, you just got to keep disciplining to moderate that level. Yeah. And 
because essentially we lose um, autonomy, we become hooked, we lose autonomy, right? You can't operate without it. You, are, you belong to it and you belong to whatever comes in, which is a very, uh, particularly with media, is a very uh, uh, unfortunate situation to be in. I mean, what's gonna come in? It's not gonna be all cheerful awakening news, is it? It's gonna be politics, persuasion, indoctrination, consumer stuff coming in, yeah. Mm. Content. <clears throat> So, you know, really using a retreat to make determined effort to reset input. So, and like every other kind of addiction, whereas your mind does get cleaner and, you know, as it gets less, you know, less hooked up to that, you start to feel really bright and balanced and grounded and you regain your autonomy. In, in to that degree. <clears throat> now, not only loss of autonomy, we lose receptivity because we're so busy, so saturated, we can't notice anything other than what we're saturated with, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the mind loses that open wonder and agility to notice subtler things, uh, to just feel its own agility and sensitivity. Yeah. So we lose receptivity to, to, to even to sense data. You know, we have certain things we notice in accordance with the time of day, this is the food, the drink, the keys, the car, the, tub, the door, the shower, and the rest of it's gone. Yeah. And we lose receptivity to other people. And say, hi, hi, yeah, hi, yeah, good, yeah. You know? Uh, and we lose receptivity to ourselves. You don't listen to yourself fully. And can you imagine, you know, the, the loss of having spent a considerable amount of your life not listening to yourself, not being receptive to yourself, n never really having lived here, but skated along a certain track because we've been herded, programmed, and we've participated in that, thinking it was going to make life happier, we were going to the successful places, the progressive places, the places where everybody else goes, the place where it's fun, where you meet people, we're going to that place, is what it says, so we go that way. So we get programmed into that. <laughs> you know, and we lose the receptivity to other things, other qualities, and most of all, if we lose receptivity to the deathless, to liberation, to the unconditioned, to qualities such as contentment, equanimity, dispassion, ease, uh, self-respect, <laughs> uh, being able to just sit and feel, feel warm-hearted yeah, to oneself. So in a way, you don't, when we lose receptivity to ourselves, we don't really attend properly to what's needed. We don't attend, we can't brush over, you know, the bruises or the minor hurts or the dull patches or the inner voice that's saying, oh no, oh no, oh no, and you just keep brushing over it because there's something else to be doing. You know, this is a flood. Uh, it sweeps us away. This is the just even the sensory level of flooding, but there's another level, the level of uh, karma. We get flooded by our habits in the way the two are involved. Uh, we get programmed and flooded by memories and by habits. So 
regrets and uh, histories and unresolved business, you might say, in a colloquial expression. Uh, things that have happened to us or things that we've done, which we haven't really completely resolved or cleared or come to terms with or even learned from properly, fully integrated and learned from. Yeah, and so we, we get, we just get bunged up, clogged. And uh, the uh, result of that is when your heart, your chitta is clogged, you don't really want to go there. It's untidy. So we, we, we tend to not deal with what should be dealt with because it just seems so, so congested and uh, messy. It's in the past, doesn't matter. So this flood of karma also has to be understood and cleared, and it can be cleared. You don't have to go through every deed, everything you've done. There's a particular skill of Dhamma, you know, skill of Dhamma practice is not about counting, it's about really liberating primary qualities of uh, the past, regret, self, sense of self, and uh, how we relate to uh, rather this um, uh, karma, cause and effect. We'll talk about that more. The last level of it is um, disposition. We're flooded because the unawakened being has a default mechanism or default program. We're born with a, a wish to get flooded. <laughs> yeah. Getting bored means let me get into, let me get into the, into the mix, yeah? Because either I need to, or it's fun, or something or the other. Yeah, there's a very irrational but program. This is what birth is. Birth is being born. Some urge we have to get into the flood of conditionality, and this is the deepest level of it, of flooding, which uh, we also give more attention to later. I don't want to flood you with too much information to begin with. Mm. Uh, but just consider, you know, the loss of autonomy, the loss of receptivity, the loss of authenticity. You know, I'm actually not really in touch with what I am. I'm just operating according to a set of instructions. <coughs> uh, and therefore our intentions also get, we go along. You know, our intentions, our actions get sort of Oh, well, that's what every other does. That's what you're supposed to do. I do that. And we lose that um, sense of decisive, you know, um, making decisive action, clear action, right action, right speech, right livelihood, not just going along. <clears throat> now, we always begin a retreat orienting around the refuges and precepts. In some way, the puja was an acknowledgement of refuge, what, these, what this is, experience is, entering the holy place, entering the sacred place, entering a place of value, uh, timeless. Mm -hmm. uh, ref the precepts are the, the, the orientation of the heart that is very significant because it goes against the pure re reactivity that can occur just if we're just following sense data, following immediate impact. Yeah. So immediate impact, the feeling, pleasure, yes. Displeasure, no, uh, don't want it. Um, want to get it as fast as possible, uh, good stuff. Uh, want to also want to escape a lot of the time. Do not, I want to be able to escape <laughs> yeah. into something that takes me a while away from being responsible. It could be, you know, harmless, apparently harmless in watching TV, watching football or something like that. Or it could be, uh, you know, escapism, computer games, um, you name it. And then it gets into really serious stuff. Yeah. Take, get me out of here. 
let me be covered, buried in something that stimulates or moves me along. Um, <laughs> and so when we take, take the precepts, we're beginning to take some clear orientation to um, not just follow the immediate pull of inclination, mm, not to just shy away from discomfort, mm, um, and to, even more important, to avoid escaping, to look at this, to avoid escaping from honesty, integrity, yeah, clarity, and so forth. And this is a very important orientation. Obviously, ethics is an important orientation for harmonious life in the world. You set that up and it helps to determine your actions. You're not just going to be following the push of the, of the consumer world. Yeah, and since ethics is very simple, you know, we've got five precepts, the eight precepts are not difficult to understand. Um, not stealing, not lying, not killing, doesn't seem that difficult to do. But when we come down to it, you recognize that by and large, even the first precept is not adhered to by the majority of people. Even to refrain from killing another human, let alone animals, creatures, fish, trees, and so forth. So why is it so difficult? <laughs> because of the flood of sensuality because of greed, consumerism, uh, irritation, intolerance, fear, um, because of karmic habits, um, karmic, karmic perceptions, karmically embedded perceptions, that it doesn't count. That's only one of those, it doesn't count. She's one of those, it doesn't matter. He's one of those, I don't like those. This is karmic accumulations. So when we take the precepts, we're working it just by doing that alone. We're putting a kind of a, a, a stop on the floods in terms of sense impact, pleasure, pain, gratification, rejection, and escapism. And we're also putting a check on uh, the flood of karmic accumulation biased perceptions um, that have been established in a causal realm thereby. You understand? Like fishing is okay. Well, ask the fish. <laughs> Do they enjoy being sport hauled out of the water with a hook in the jaw? Did you ever look at it like that? How could they possibly enjoy that? Doesn't it bother you that, that they don't enjoy that and they don't they don't do it to you. You know, if you imagine walking along a you know, path and seeing a, a nice cake and grabbing hold of it and there's a hook in your jaw and it pulls you <laughs> into the water. <laughs> That's what happens to fish. You know, just going fishing, you know, like, but the, the karmic, uh, you know, acquisition is that that's fine. That's a peaceful, tranquil afternoon if you're not a fish. Right. Yeah, you know, it's like, uh, it's not being, this is called deep attention, just look at things fully, cause and effect fully, you know, the results rather than self-centered. And so ethics establishes the field of mutuality. There's more than just me. It's not just me that counts. It's me and everything else that counts. Yeah. So it all counts. Yeah. That's called mutuality. And once there's mutuality, you've established that respect. What does the heart feel like when it's in the mode of respect? Yeah. It feels, does that feel good? What's the mode heart feel like when it's in the mode of compassion? I feel good. What does it feel like when it's in a mode of um, 
sensitivity, tender-heartedness. Feel good? Hmm? Forgiveness. How's that feel? Hmm? So really, in, in uh, cultivating this ethical and mutuality principle deeply, we're freeing ourselves. We're doing ourselves a huge favor. Because all that comes back to the heart, doesn't it? But remember, this is I voluntarily undertake, I want to. This is autonomous, right? This is not, if you don't do this, we're going to blame you and throw you out and, da -da 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 -da, and you'll be damned forever. No, autonomy, respect. Up to you. But consider things wisely, deeply. You count. Your heart counts. And if you really look at this, consider it deeply and experiment with this and look into it, see, isn't it just feel better, feel clearer, feel stabler, more stable when I, I orient around ethics? less casual, less taken for granted, less dismissive, less intolerant. Um, yeah, and then it's a nice place to be. So sila leads you into meditation because now you've got something you want to be with. Yeah, and it's amazing how the heart can feel so congested and jammed up. And then, but the heart is a constantly changing territory. It's not an entity. If you start aligning it to things like virtue, it moves out of the territory of regret and guilt and agitation. It starts to, oh, there's this too. We owe it to ourselves to take the heart out of the flood. And it's a determination and practice of that. Um, and why? And, for, and why? Sila in a sukating yanti. Sila is a vehicle for Sukhating, happiness, accomplishment, fulfillment. Silena, Bulga Sampada, Bulga, treasure, Sampada, completion. Sila is a vehicle of morality, ethics is a vehicle for, for the deep resource of the heart. It's a treasure. Silena Nibbutinyati. It leads to the vehicle for the cooling of anger, passion. Despair, regret, violence, cools. Therefore, a wise person cultivates their sila, their ethics. And when we have the occasion and we do this as a community, yeah, we do this collectively, and it's one of the first things we do. Uh, certainly in monasteries, for one of the first things you do when you come in, you sort of want to do that. Place yourself there, place yourself in the real temple, which is the temple of the heart. And then you, you, you can carry around with you. And then around, everybody else is doing it, but you feel very safe and comfortable. And nobody's going to do some number on you or take your stuff. So let's go through the formal formality of it. And uh, as I say, when we're, unfortunately, the technology is that uh, you'll only hear my voice, uh, but you can imagine there's another 200 something people right beside you all over the world who are chanting, doing the same thing and inclining in the same way. So, um, now is the opportunity for someone to request the refuges and the precepts.
So these are deter these are measures against or flagging the movements of uh, uh, gratification, uh, using other creatures for fun, destroying their lives either out of malice or out of indifference or just for pleasure, which people do. Uh, um, obviously, uh, taking things which are not given out of malice, gratification, or just because it's fun, escapism, um, sexually using people either out of malice or for gratification or just because <laughs> it's fun <laughs> and so on. <laughs> Uh, and we get to speech, actually, the, the, the fourth pre precept of, of speech is um, somewhat more evolved than just this telling lies. It's also to do with um, gossiping, the, the impish delight one has in stabbing people <laughs> behind their back. <laughs> so people enjoy having a, a little bit of a you know, poke at somebody. It's not, yeah, it's a sort of strange, strange uh, uh, gratification. Mm. Yeah. Gossiping, slandering, cursing, getting, because the speech acts as an emotional uh, release. We express emotion. And also, we even feel we have a right to express our emotions. I, I'm, I'm allowed to express my emotions. I'm a free person. You know, I want to be free to express my emotions. Yeah, okay, but could you just do it somewhere else? <laughs> you know, do I have to receive them all? <laughs> I think I guess it's kind of those, one of the uh, absurdities of the cult of the individual. <laughs> <laughs> my truth it doesn't matter what you think this is my truth this is my there's no such thing as my freedom my freedom is is not it's it's a, it's a there's our live our release from these grips of passion if it's my freedom it really means it's somebody else's problem <laughs> yeah and so we then look at how speech can be just the dumping and uh teasing and blaming and stereotyping, abusing and venting of emotions that you should deal with yourself. You know, express your feelings, well, express them for yourself. You're the one who's happening to, you listen to them, <laughs> work with them. <laughs> you know, if you want my help, that's fine, but let's do it in a very careful and clear way, you know. You know? So this, uh, this is a very, this is quite a key precept because this one, speech precept, plugs straight into the thinking mind. It's, it's the way the thinking mind operates. So once you get that one, you've got a very good way of putting a handbrake on some crazy thoughts or even contemplating them and saying, ooh, where's that one coming from? Ooh, let's have a look into that. Whereas if, you know, so because thinking and speaking are just pretty much the same thing. And because speech is just gone, you know, we think it doesn't count. I just said it, it's gone. Well, you know, but of course it isn't gone because you heard it. You're the one who said it, you heard it. So the results are sitting right there. And if you said it to somebody else, they heard it and their results are sitting right there. So it's not gone. And one should be very careful about what one is saying because of that, the power of it. And even what you're thinking. And so just carelessly fantasizing or you know we have these urges gratification urges escapist urges malice yeah okay but let's really look into that because these are where the floods hit the surface and start becoming actions where the undercurrents of our accumulated floods of dispositions and karma hits the surface and starts spilling out into action through 
thought and speech and then you've really got some more business to do to mop it all up. So really useful to talk about things that uh, you know in a careful way that are necessary um, properly conflict in confidentialities negotiated not just blabbing but is this the right time the right place um, and asking for and not just being a broadcaster but also I say something let me tell me how did that sound you know we're pretty we're better broadcasters than receivers most of us but you want to also say something how's that how are you going to learn otherwise you know how are you going to learn you should get something back you know do you listen to your own story all the time you want to get something back if you're going to talk you should be someone who uses their ears as much as their mouth yeah. like chanting and then you oh how does that sound get some feedback on it this is skillful speech and then we begin to recognize what's what's pushing what the floods are because a lot of these floods are not even really noticed we are like fish flushed along in the stream so much in it you don't even notice the water because you're in that current so these precepts tend to put some some markers down where you can hey find yourself being restrained by something by a precept and you take that step um, as i said escapism is a big uh, part of what how we how we get flooded and uh you know so alcohol apart from anything else you know too much about almost certainly it's going to be bad speech criminality sexual abuse violence you know it's 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 you know it's it's, it's right it's linked together uh, so but then even just a little bit is like well, what, what for uh, um, you know what for what's the so you yeah, and clearly thing entertainment beautification adornment and so forth well aren't you beautiful already <laughs> yeah. um, so if one abides in the sphere of loving kindness then it's uh, it's everything is beautiful people are beautiful you live in the sphere of the beautiful so you don't need beautification but course it's the issue is that people escape from their own skin from what they look like or what they fear they look like or what they escape into something that they imagine is more interesting or desirable than living something that's not true then of course the final escape is get the head under the pillow get the blankets get the duvet get the quilt over enough of the day and so we try to exercise uh, uh, wise attention over our, our tendency to, to, to um, you know, doze off and lull and, uh, you know. now you know but remember this is these are why so it's not like you've got to sleep on a bed of nails or a plank or something or but uh, you're looking at the, the intentions and the attitudes uh, that, that can go along with these these uh, precepts and how you're checking them and this alone is a tremendous help um, in um, crossing getting out of the floods the buddha said this is this is uh through cultivating this on crosses, one is a flood crosser. And it's then it's in refining it. So you're really looking into how the mind operates and the gratification impulse, the malicious, dismissive, doesn't matter. So what? You know, it's his problem, that impulse. And once again, the last delusion is the last one, the escapism. Yeah, which seems so I'm just going to watch some movies what's the problem oh, well because if you're in a movie are you present in your body you yeah, know I'm aware of the movie but are you aware of what's happening in your own heart or you're aware of what the movie's doing to you yeah. so you're escaping from 
the realities of your own of heart which have to be cleared and will you get the best result so that's the, the ending of escape um, so that one can actually escape from the flood the buddha said yeah there is an escape i teach the escape but the escape is not escapism escapism takes you into the flood the escape of liberation takes you out of it and this is the training and a path so let's take a few minutes why don't you take five or six minutes or so just to freshen up and then we can go through some uh, meditation together um, uh, to establish some primary meditation practice so um, take five minutes to flex your legs um, freshen up take a breath and i'll get back in five minutes time <laughs> 